This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. It's Monday, and you know what that means, research in Manoa. Oh, I'm Jay Fidel here on Think Tech. This is our premier scientific show, and we have an old friend come back. Uh, that's uh, Andrea Gabrielli, Gabrielli from HIGP. Nice to see you, Jay. Nice to be here. Yeah, nice to see you. Now, uh, Andrea is uh, he's born in Cincinnati, wasn't it? Oh, that, quite. That, that's close. That's close. Close enough. <laughs> Are there many Italian restaurants in Cincinnati? Oh, yes. You're born in Italy, where they have plenty of volcanic activity in Italy, and that is a connection there. And he's a research assistant at HIGP, the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology, working under Robert Wright, who is the director of that uh, institute right now. Yeah. Yep, that's right. That's right. And he's working on uh, sensors uh, in geology and the like, and that takes him on trips to see geological phenomena. Hawaii is a wonderful place for this kind of research. Uh, and recently you went on a trip to a lake. What, what, tell us about the lake. Could I sail on the lake, Andrea? Of course, but just once. <laughs> <laughs> and only for that, a moment. <laughs> only for a moment. So we're talking about a, a lava lake on the summit of Kilauea Volcano. That's the lava lake that's within the, the, the crater, which is within Halema'oma'o. Um, and so um, we went there on a permit uh, with the USGS and the National Park Service uh, to collect data and study the gases and the dynamics of this uh, uh, stunning phenomenon. Lava lakes are extremely rare. There are only five lakes, uh, active lakes on the Earth, ah. because it's, uh, you need to have a combination of various uh, things to actually gather a molten pool of rocks and, and so have a... Uh, a lava lake. They're dangerous too, aren't they? Oh yeah, absolutely. You try to absolutely. sail in a lake like that, it's oh, uh, only once for a few oh, minutes okay. and you're finished. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and in fact, this is why we had to go through this. Uh, um, uh, the USGS and the National Park Service granted us a permission to actually go there because we remember again the floor of the caldera of Kilauea is closed due to ongoing volcanic hazards and particularly the gases that are released that are extremely toxic. Yeah, yeah, so it's not just that you could be burned up, it's the gases could hurt your respiratory system. A absolutely, absolutely. And that's actually even, that's even the source of the fog that sometimes we experience even here on Oahu yeah, sure. when, the, when the winds are from the south. Well, I want to um, examine exactly, you know, what you what you did and learned in the lake. But to, to make it, uh, you know, uh, relevant uh, for us, uh, I want to I want to take a quote that you sent me. This is a quote by the British poet William Wadsworth, um, and it uh, it stands for the proposition of a lake carries you into recesses of knowledge, especially if you're doing a PhD on sensors and geological phenomena. Uh, 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 recesses of knowledge otherwise impenetrable. And just to put it in perspective, uh, Alexa, who is William Wordsworth? William Wordsworth was a major English romantic poet who, oh. with Samuel Taylor Coleridge, <laughs> helped to launch the Romantic Age in English literature with their joint publication, Lyrical Ballads. Thank you, Alexa. That seems to be right. <laughs> seems to be right. <laughs> <laughs> and so why, why is a lake, a lava lake, uh, the kind of lake that he's talking about in terms of the fact that it could give you the recesses of knowledge that were otherwise impenetrable? Let's see what a lava lake is. Let's take a glimpse. Let's peek into the Earth's interior. And let's, uh, I think we have our first video and we can have a glimpse of what a lava lake is. Oh, here it is. Um, a lava lake, as you can see here, is a pool of molten material that convects in a cycle. And we can see the, the, the surface of the lake is divided into pieces, uh, plates, if you like, and we can see the, the red boundaries of these plates. We can see two uh, sources of spattering uh, at the um, end of the lake. And this lake is actually, we're looking at the summit of Kilauea Volcano, and this is the largest lake in the world now, because this one recently overtook the, the width of the <laughs> Nairagongo Lava Lake, 
and Africa on the African Rift and became the largest, 300 meters in diameter, more than 300 meters in diameter. So that helps in terms of understanding. You were at the top of the rim of the lake. We were at the rim, that's and right. And you look down, how far below you is the floor of the lake? The floor of Halema'oma'o was about uh, 100, uh, 100 meters below us. And then, but the lake was, uh, at, w when we were looking at, um, when we were there at the, the end of July, the lake was about 30 meters below the floor of Halema'oma'o. Ah, so that's the, that, that's the, the two the, levels, the floor the, and then below that. Uh, the that's right. So let's see our next picture. Uh, and we can see, th th that's right, here it is. This is a... Um, I'm telling you, it looks like a jacuzzi. It's kind of it's an a <laughs> overbuilt jacuzzi. <laughs> if you want, it's like a sink. Uh, it's a, a sink. It's a sink because it's, it's a pool of, 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 of material which is connected to a tube, to a conduit down below, which goes to the magma chamber. Yeah. And like a sink, if you like, it goes up and down the level, goes oh, up and it? down. Oh. Um, it, it recently overflowed about a year ago, and, uh, and uh, the only difference with the sink is the temperature. This is about 1,000 1, degrees C, so it's a little bit hotter than the water that comes out our sinks. And also it goes uh, the, the, the other way. So it doesn't flow from the top, but it comes up from the bottom. So it bubbles. And particularly, you can see the source of this material on the right-hand side. You can see the, the red material coming out. Yes. And then you see there is some, uh, there is like a track. There is like, uh, the material is being carried away from that source, uh, away from it. You can see there is sort of a pathway, sort yeah, of, a, yeah. if you want, the, the color is, uh, is different. It's sort of silver. Yeah. And then the material stinks as it becomes colder and denser. So this is, a, uh, this is a cycle, so it goes up and down, up and down, and it's sort of like a, a convection. It's like a boiling soup of potatoes in, in, a, in a cold winter. Here in Hawaii we have cold winters, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's really uh, what it is. It's a convective mechanism yeah. that, that, that brings the material up and then downwards, so, upwelling regions and downwards. So when it's warm, when it's hot. In, in the red area, or the, the glowing area, it's going to rise. Yeah. And as it cools, it's going to it's going to go back down into the pot. It's going to sink. That's right. So if I if I if I look down, sort of as a as a silo, I see this lake as a silo of material. I mean, how far would it? And not that we would swim here, but how far would it go in this molten form? Does it go to the center of the Earth? Where does it go? Well, as I said, this is uh, connected to a conduit that then goes down to the magma chamber. Um, but when this vent, uh, this lake started to form back in March 2008, uh, the lava lake was not there. There was a violent uh, explosive eruption at the summit of Kilauea. And then, uh, and then what happened was that slowly the eruption began to fill this, this, uh, this fissure, this vent, uh, and fill it, and then form the lava lake. When this was, was um, beginning, the depth of this, of this um, vent, this cavity, was uh, two, three hundred meters. So that's some sort of gives you an idea of what we're looking at within. And, and, and lava lakes are particularly important from a scientific point of view. Because, for example, the movement of the plates uh, on the surface, which sinks and rise, can be... Um, um, compared with what really happens on the surface of the Earth by looking at the, the plates, uh, the plate tectonics. Uh, for example, you know, the subduction and... Subduction? And, and, sub they have that a lot in Washington, and they have it in Hollywood, too. In the morning paper, it was a case of a fellow who lost his job over s subduction. Subduction over a uh, company. <laughs> <laughs> Never now, mind. Here we're talking about um, rocks sinking... Uh, uh, and this, uh, if you think about um, what is happening, uh, for example, on the Cascade Range in Washington and, Port and, and Oregon states, yeah. that's really the, the, the Juan de Fuca plate going uh, underneath the North American plate, and that's create volcanic, vo that's create volcanism. Does it also create earthquakes? Uh, uh, earthquakes as well associated with the rising of magma. Uh -huh. It's different from the, uh, the San Andreas Fault, for example. That's a different mechanism. It's not related to you, is it, the San Andreas Fault? Uh, 
Well, yeah, it, it, it was my ancestor. No, I'm just. <laughs> no, this is this is really. Um, it's a fault in 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 California, and uh, but that creates earthquakes. But that's a different uh, uh, mechanism. Here we're talking about sliding plates. Yes. There we're talking about subduction. Yes. But a lava lake, as uh, our friend. Uh, William Wordsworth at the beginning was sort of reminding us, although he was talking about something else. Um, uh, a lava lake can give us an idea about the mechanisms that really happen within the Earth and really it, it try and give us an understanding of what of, of phenomena that we can't really uh, so, see. So can you us. give a moment about your you know, research, your science here? You're, you're taking readings, you're getting data. What readings, what data are you getting when you stand at the, at the rim of this, um, this lake? And, uh, and, and what conclusions can you, do you draw from that data? Let's uh, bring, I think we have a picture that shows us standing on the rim of the lake. So we can, we can actually see what we were doing. Oh, there it is, yeah. So um, on the right, we have uh, um, my supervisor again, Robert Wright. Uh, and uh, Casey Hannibal, who is my friend and co-worker. And then we can see in yellow, uh, Matt Patrick, who is one of the geologists at the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory who came with us. We're pointing down at the lake, imaging spectrometers uh, to try and detect the gases that are released by this volcano. And particularly, what we're trying to do, Casey is doing it in the mid-wave infrared. I am doing it in the thermal infrared, so different regions of the electromagnetic spectrum. Mm -hmm. And what we're trying to do is detect carbon dioxide. Now, it's, uh, as you know, there is a lot of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Uh, so it's particularly difficult to, to, de to separate, to identify the carbon dioxide which is released by the volcano and can tell us what is happening to the magma chamber down below from the atmospheric Carbon dioxide. So how do you do that? That's right. We use uh, this. We, we're we're testing these kind of sensors. Uh, we're testing this kind of sensor on detecting these gases to see if we have if we can actually detect these gases. Because uh, uh, volcanologists have used sulfur dioxide for a while now um, to infer about what is happening in the magma chamber. But sulfur dioxide is sort of easy because uh, there is not, not a lot of it. There in is the not atmosphere. a lot of sulfur dioxide yeah. in the atmosphere, yeah. so you can immediately identify the volcanic one. Yeah. But uh, with carbon dioxide is more tricky. But why are volcanologists interested in carbon dioxide? Why is it better? It's more difficult, but why is it better? Yeah. Well, you know, this is a really perfect time. It's what I call a cliffhanger, literally. <laughs> <laughs> so Don't, jump. <laughs> Don't jump. Don't jump. We're going to find out the answer to that question right after we come back. And right now, we're going to have a break with uh, Andrea Gabrielli of the HIGP research team that was uh, at, at the Lava Lake in uh, Mauna Kea. We'll be right back. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. My friend, Mother, what big eyes you have. She said, all the better to see you with my dear. What are you doing? Okay, cool. Research says reading from birth accelerates the baby's brain development. And you're doing that now? Oh, yeah, ah. yeah. this is the starting line. Push. Ah. Ah. When this is over, you're dead. Read aloud 15 minutes. Every child, every parent, every day. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. Every Friday afternoon at 2 p.m., I hope you'll join me for Likeable Science, where we'll dig into science, dig into the meat of science, dig into the joy and delight of science. We'll discover why science is indeed fun, why science is interesting, why people should care about science, and care about the research that's being done out there. It's all great, it's all entertaining, it's all educational, so I hope you'll join me for Likeable Science. Okay, we're back. We're live with, uh, with uh, Andrea G Gabrielli of HIGP, the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology. He's a research assistant there, and he's studying sensors in geological formations. And he was at, I was only joking when I said Mauna Kea, it was Kilauea, 
That's where right. you were. Yeah. Kilauea Volcano. Kilauea That's Volcano, right. yeah. It was a spectacular <laughs> place. And really, I mean, you, you, I, you could get up there. I can't get up there, but maybe I'll go with you next time. <laughs> If I can breathe all right. Did you have trouble breathing up there? Uh, well, we luckily we didn't, but only because we were wearing a respirator with HEPA particle pre-filters oh, oh, oh. to actually prevent the sulfur dioxide to get into our um, lungs and oh. everything. Does it really injure you? So you were talking about you know exactly how you discern the kind of carbon monoxide that's in the air in general and the kind of carbon monoxide that's coming out of the uh, uh, carbon dioxide. dioxide, pardon me, <laughs> it's a test. The carbon dioxide that's in the air generally and the carbon dioxide that's, in, that's in the, coming out of the lake in the volcano. So how do you do that? Um, we, 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 we use this, this uh, thermal light spectral imaging sensor, but this is still a test. We went there actually to test our abilities with these sensors to measure this carbon dioxide. But we stopped the, uh, before the break with the, the, the famous question, the, 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 the suspense, and we were saying why are volcanologists interested in, in carbon dioxide? The reason is because carbon dioxide starts to be exhaled, starts to be released, be separated from the silicate melt that is rising, when the melt, the magma, is still really deep, deep in the volcano. So basically, the, the, this is the reason why. It could give us uh, uh, warnings, uh, early warnings, about uh, what is happening in the volcano. Whereas sulfur dioxide, easier to be detected, however, uh, it, it, it is released by the, the rising magma when the magma is already really close to the surface. So just to give you an example, there is a volcano in Alaska and Mount Redoubt, and scientists were monitoring. That's near the, Juno. The, that's near Juno. Is that the one that blew up? That's blew back up. In that's the right. 50s, I think it was. Um, I think the uh, Mount Redoubt is more recent eruption. Yeah, okay, I'm talking about. Okay. But anyway, um, the the car the the volcano, before it blew up, it began to exhale carbon dioxide a couple of months before the eruption happened. Whereas it started to release sulfur dioxide a few days before the eruption. So this is why volcanologists are really interested in carbon dioxide, because it could give us warnings. And this is a, a very important when trying to warn the populations living nearby active volcanoes uh, and, and uh, to try and prevent death and future death from natural disasters. So you have to have a device that can read this remotely because you can't be standing there all the time. Well, we don't want to go too close. You don't close. want to be close, right. So, and it has to send you a message to say there's, you know, there's too much in the, in the air here. Absolutely. So you have to take some action to warn people. Yeah? So the, 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 the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory is interested in what we're doing in this uh, possibility, because we haven't really detected carbon dioxide yet. We're still testing it, yeah. Uh, but the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory in the USGS was interested in our sensors, in the sensors that Paul Lucy, uh, Robert Wright have developed, um, because uh, they could give us the, 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 these kind of warnings. And that's exactly the reason why uh, they granted us a permit, as well as the National Park sure. Service. Um, but um, so lava lakes uh, um, can, can really give us lots of information about the gases and the activities. Uh, but let's uh, maybe watch uh, uh, one more video to see the activity of lava lakes. So I think we have uh, um, the video, uh, the second video, I think, uh, about, uh, oh, I think there it is, yeah. So here we were standing on the rim, and, and this is a much less a serene view than the other one. We can see a huge spattering fountain here and waves in the molten material. Uh, this fountain, this, this spattering source is a, uh, throws material up to even 10 feet into the air. So what we are looking at is actually the top of the spatter. That's the top of the, yeah, we were looking at it from, um, we were looking at it from, from above, from we were standing on the rim, looking yeah. down, looking down. At so if the, you were down at the same level, you would see it jumping ten feet in the air, but absolutely, you, you wouldn't see it for too long because yeah. you would be burned to a crisp. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. <laughs>
And, and uh, um, I think um, let's see let's see one more picture so we can talk about uh, more the dangers of this. this let's this see the bird laser. picture. This that, is the right. bird picture. Uh, this is a video, and you can see there is a bird flying over the surface of the lake. It's hard to see if it's up in the what upper right hand corner. Yeah, we can see the white spot. Maybe let, let's watch the game. What do you think? Um, yeah. That's why so we can really see, and then we can make some comments. Yeah, let's see um, that one more time. Yeah. Um, so the thing about the the bird is that the bird is in in the fog, in the fog, if you will. In the in the sulfur dioxide yes, it, gases. Yeah. And the bird the bird doesn't do well at that. The bird is n not any better able to handle it than we are. Not really. The the bird is a koya kea bird, one of these long white tailed tropic birds, about two feet the wingspan. So it's a they, they're large seabirds that nest on the walls of Halemaomao. They fly to the ocean during the day and they feed on fish and then they come back. They nest there because there are no predators. However, um, usually the adults fly high above the thermals generated by the lava lake. Fly on the thermal, yeah. On the thermals, yeah. ab way above the, the, the thermals. Yeah. However, um, we think uh, this one was uh, a juvenile that got inexperienced, uh, got too close, and was blinded and intoxicated by the hot gases rising from the lake. Yeah. And it was forced to land, as we could see oh. in the in the in the movie. It was forced. It was forced to land on the surface of the lake and was roasted. Uh, what a tragedy! It, it's a, it's a, Did it's you see a, him land? You couldn't see him though. It was we, too, we the could, smoke was too uh, dense. The, the 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 smoke was dense, but we 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 could actually see. Uh, the bird uh, burning when when oh. it was so it was a horrible scene. But this really tells us uh, about the dangers uh, of uh, and the uh, about two uh, two thousand tons per day of sulfur dioxide are released by that crater alone. Then there is Pu'u'o'o, uh -oh, that's the other event on the southwest rift zone, southeast rift zone. But that's a, that, that's another event. Only Halemaomao puts out two thousand tons per day. Of sulfur dioxide. Yeah, Absolutely. and there is a and there is an interesting story. Uh, um, we were uh, standing while this uh, um, poor bird met his destiny. Um, <laughs> we were talking to Matt Patrick, uh, who is um, the, one of the geologists there at the HBO, yeah. and he was telling us that um, he was reading some papers about uh, uh, by Thomas Jagger, uh, who is the founder of HBO, and he was. Uh, talking about these birds that, that fall into the lake sometimes. Uh, but um, he was mentioning that uh, after Jagger, nobody really witnessed uh, to these birds, because it's really, usually the crater, the, the caldera floor is closed, and people are, aren't allowed to go there. There was a special permission that was granted to us. But um, so we were sort of, we saw this uh, after Thomas, Jag Thomas Jagger, so that was uh, kind of a, Interesting thing, to, although very sad, but it, again reminds us of the dangers of this gas. Yeah. So w when you get the data, what's the form of the data, and how do you interpolate the data, um, and you know come to scientific conclusions so that you can, uh, I guess, get get a, a system going to know when you're reaching danger levels. So these sensors gather image, and for every pixel, every spot in the image we can gather uh, spectral information. So what it means basically is that there is a source of light, in this case it's infrared light, mm. coming to the sensor. Now the source of the, the, the light in this case is the lava lake. The gas within absorbs part of the light at specific wavelengths. Now what we look in these sensors is the depth the missing light, if you want, at specific wavelength, and the depth of these features, how much light is missing, if you want, gives us, gives us the amount of gases that is in there. So by looking at the depth of these absorption emission features in the spectra, so the missing light, we can tell how much gas is in the plume, and then try to infer what is happening. Um, so now, Within when you the, look at one pixel, yeah. okay, if you have, if you don't have a high resolution, that pixel could include a number of gases, couldn't it? 
so how, you know, is, are we saying that one pixel is one kind of gas? I mean, you can only identify one kind of gas, or can we identify multiple gases in the one pixel? No. For one pixel, basically, we get a spectrum from 8 to 14 microns. And each gas absorbs light at specific wavelengths. So sulfur dioxide, for example, absorbs most of the light at 8.6 microns. So we look at that particular wavelength and we say, okay, this is sulfur dioxide. Other gases, such as carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide is a nice feature at 14 microns. So basically, for each pixel, yeah. we can have, we can um, um, obtain, we can retrieve a spectrum, and the spectrum tell us stories about different gases. So we can, we can basically, uh, we can look at various gases released from the uh, volcano. And again, most common gases are carbon dioxide, which is the one we talked about, sulfur dioxide also mentioned, and also don't forget water vapor because uh, volcanoes are also a great uh, source of water vapor coming from uh, beneath the mantle. Well, what is, what is water, uh, H2O? H2O, or? water vapor, just water. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. How about just oxygen? Do you, can you see that too? Um, is there any oxygen no, coming out of the lake? Well, no, there's no oxygen coming out of the lake, um, but um, uh, we can, um, oxygen, in, in the infrared part of the spectrum, oxygen is not particularly active, so it doesn't even absorb uh, uh, and emit light. So you so, don't care about it? No. Uh, but if we remember William Wordsworth and his romantic lakes uh, <laughs> in the northwestern part of England, uh, those lakes really emit oxygen. <laughs> so the, fight, the, the vegetation, the algae that are in, in there can yeah. release oxygen. Yeah, interesting, yeah. So see, we... <laughs> <laughs> so it comes back to it him. It comes back to William Wordsworth. So now, w Lake when you look at all the pixels, you're putting it in a spreadsheet or a database somewhere, and evaluating, um, you know, the, the relative density of this kind of gas versus that kind of gas. So if I give you a lot, for example, of sulfur dioxide and not so much of carbon dioxide, what is that going to tell me? I'm looking for proportions, right? I'm looking for a relative relative presence, right? Absolutely. And again, um, carbon dioxide and, and sulfur dioxide are exhaled, released from the magma at different depths. So if you find more of this or more of that, it, it, it basically tells you, it, 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 you don't really are 100% sure because then you have to put it in, in perspective and even consider earthquakes or deformation or other geological and geophysical factors to actually effectively monitor volcanoes. However, it, it, it gives you an insight of what is happening in the, in the magma chamber within the plumbing system of the volcano. And really, when you put it in perspective with other geophysical measurements and everything, it, 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 it basically fosters our knowledge. And, 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 and um, so we can really try and predict volcanic eruptions and, and try to um, in, in fear what is happening well, below. One last question, Andrea. So you're working on trying to identify what's there, what, what kind of gases are coming out. Yeah. But do you have a model to compare it against for what kind of gases would be coming out uh, with a prospective uh, eruption you know, uh, happening? In other words, do you have a profile that you look at to make the comparison? Um, this is more a geological, uh, th that's, the, that's the ultimate goal that all the, the volcanologists have. Um, yes, by looking at what we call solubility laws, yeah. we can infer where the magma is and try and understand what is happening. But my um, research at, uh, at the HIGP is mostly on uh, building, uh, uh, retrieving algorithm to actually uh, gather this information and also to develop sensors that can be used. In this particular case, we were pointing at the lava lake, but in the past, we were also looking at the sky. And so trying and look at these gases against the cold background of the sky and, and also monitor, for example, uh, air pollution and fog. And so there are, here we're talking about gases, but this. Um, um, imaging spectrometers in the thermal infrared hyperspectral sensor can really give us um, even a lot of other information about uh, 
uh, gases and pollution as well. But in terms of uh, in terms of volcanoes and lava lake, uh, that's it, it really gives an, an insight to peek into the Earth interior and try and understand what is happening below. Thank you, Andrea. <laughs> Andrea Gabrielli, a research assistant at HIGP, the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology in Stowe West at UH Manoa. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jay. Aloha. Aloha. <laughs>